Welcome to the Performing Arts Series brought to you by the Kennedy Center and the Prince William Network. I'm Maria Salvador, your moderator for today's program. Joining me as hosts are Sarah Ann Laprade and Derek Braxton, students at Hilton High School in Prince William County. With us is Richard Peck, teacher turned writer, who among numerous honors has been awarded the Newbery Medal. This medal is presented to the author of the book that is considered the most distinguished contribution to American literature for young people in a given publishing year. Above all else, Mr. Peck is a storyteller with novels and short stories his arena. His books are filled with memorable characters, real events, authentic emotions, and riveting action. He writes with humor and verve and has captivated readers with over 30 books. We'll take a look at how Mr. Peck came to tell stories, explore some of his motivations, meet some of his characters, and consider what happens when fact and fiction collide. Welcome, Richard Peck. Thank you, Maria. You were born in a Midwest home uh, where language and ideas were important. What were some of the early influences on the man who was to become such a well-known writer? Well, one of my very earliest influences was a mother who read to me. I had a mother who read to me in those first five fleeting years of life, and that made me anxious to get to school so I could read for myself. She filled me up with words, and that's lucky because a novel is written one word at a time. And I had a father who was older than the other boy's fathers. He had been born in the 1890s, and his stories about being a barefoot boy in the country merged in my mind with Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn. And the minute you can see somebody coming alive off of a book, you're ready to write. You've said that all stories begin with what if. How has that influenced you, that question, what if? It's true. A story is what if, not what is. What if you lived in the 1930s and had to go to grandma's house every summer for a week? I asked a group the other day and a boy said, I wouldn't go. I said, why not? And he said, she only has three channels. So I, uh, what if you were living in the 1930s when adults still ruled the world? I didn't, I don't remember that time. I wasn't sent to grandma's house. But I wonder, what if I had been? What if I'd lived in the Civil War? What if I got to go to the World's Fair of 1893? What if? My whole world is what if. Well, when people read A Long Way From Chicago and A Year Down Yonder, they seem to be most struck with Grandma Dowdle. In fact, Grandma Dowdle comes to life uh, on stage in a theater adaptation of A Long Way From Chicago. Whether in the pages of a novel or on the stage, Grandma Dowdle is a memorable character who appears in both novels, but she first appeared in another short story. Tell us a bit about how you found this character or maybe how she found you. Did you ever know anyone like Grandma Dowdle? Did I ever know anybody like Grandma Dowdle? Uh, I did, but she's not my grandmother. She's a what if. She's the grandmother I wish I'd had. Do you wish you'd had her? Yeah. Would you rather have her for a grandmother or a mother? A grandmother. You bet. And that's why she's a grandmother in the story. Nobody wants a mother who's trigger happy <laughs> and uh, uh, is the scariest woman in town. But to have a grandmother, yeah. Uh, so that's why she's the grandmother. The mother in the story is hardly there at all. She just sends them off. Um, she came to be because a friend of mine named Harry Mazur, a wonderful writer, was putting together a, a collection of gun stories. So I said, I'd try. I wanted to do one that would be different from all his others. I thought they'd all be about boys and men, and they'd all be about blood flowing in the gutter. So I thought, how can I surprise Harry? I know. I'll write a story about a woman, not a man, and it'll be funny, not bloody. And suddenly, there was Grandma with her shotgun standing in my door. She's never left. She, ta she changed my life. She won me a pair of ascending newberries, and now she's as real to me as if she had been my grandmother, but she wasn't. 
Would you share a bit of story of the story that features Grandma Daddle and Shotgun Cheatham? Sure. It's that it came from the first short story from which the book derives. Shotgun Cheatham is an old derelict guy who lives in a chicken coop. He has done nothing with his life. But the kids wonder about him now that he's dead. I'll tell you how Shotgun got his name, says Grandma. He wasn't but about ten years old, and he wanted to go out and shoot quail with a bunch of older boys. He couldn't hit a barn wall from the inside, and he had a sty in one eye. They were out there in the pasture without a quail in sight. But Shotgun got all excited being with the big boys. He squeezed off around and killed a cow. Down she went. If he'd been aiming at her, she'd have died of old age eventually. The boys took the gun off him, not knowing who he'd plug next. That's how he got the name, and it stuck to him like flypaper. Any girl in town could have outshot him, and that includes me, said Grandma. But by the time she finishes telling the press about him, he's a Civil War hero. Because Grandma's a storyteller, too. <laughs> what if? What if? What if? In a long way from Chicago, Joey and his sister Mary Alice make the annual summer visit to Grandma Dowdle's small Illinois town. Quite an experience for children from the big city. The stories begin around the start of the Great Depression in 1929 when Joey is nine years old and Mary Alice is seven. Their summers with Grandma continue until 1935 when they're 15 and 13 years old and start realizing that they're growing up. Your Newbery Medal uh, winning book, A Year Down Yonder, begins two years later in 1937. Mary Alice is 15. Joey, now 17, is out west working in the Conservation Corps. And their father has just lost his job in the Roosevelt Recession. In both books, you've created the feel of a small town and included a lot of detail about that time period in your novels. What kind of research do you have to do and how do you make us feel like we've lived there? First of all, I never use my memories. I never write about a boy growing up when I grew up. So I'm using my dad's memories because my dad's memories are more glamorous and dramatic to me. So I use his town, grandma's house with the lightning rods and the privy, the last house in town before the open fields. I didn't grow up there. I borrow other people's memories and then I go to the library. Every book begins in the library in the hope that it will end there. So it's 1937, and Mary Alice is going to tell the story. That's all I know. So I go to the library to the place where they keep all of the copies of Time magazine for 1937. And I go in with a big pad of paper, and I write down a timeline of 1937 so that I'll know what people were talking about then. For example, the most famous woman in America vanishes without a trace in the summer of 1937. And we still can't find her. Who is she? Who is the woman who vanished without a trace? Amelia Earhart. Amelia Earhart. I have to mention her because people talked about her in those days. And so, after I got to the fall of 1937, I realized there was another market crash. And that gave me my idea for my next book. Mary Alice's family would lose their apartment in Chicago, and she'd have to go live there. She'd have to go to that school with 25 high school kids arriving every morning by mule. Are they glad to see her? No. Anybody who thinks small towns are friendly lives in a big city. Uh, so the first chapter is called Rich Chicago Girl. Can Grandma save her? Mm. Up to a point. Because, of course, Grandma will give her some ideas about being herself. And the only way you can survive in this world is by being yourself, not by being other people. Well, the Coffee House Cafe is, is prominent in both Long Way from Chicago yes. and in Year Down Yonder. Yes. And I think that kind of, for me, creates the hub of, of the community. Yes. Could you share that scene in A Long Way from Chicago? 
Sure. There's a local hangout every place, uh, like the cafeteria in a school where everybody meets and tells lies. Um, and um, the Coffee Pot Cafe is this place. And Mary Alice and Joey like to go down there and hang out because Grandma never goes there. And they like to be in a place where she's not ruling occasionally. The only people in the coffee pot cafe were a couple of farm women passing the time of day with Mrs. Ike Cripe. As proprietor, Mrs. Cripe wore a tro crocheted handkerchief pinned to her apron and a hairnet. She saw us come in, and you could tell she wanted our nickels before we fished our pop out of the water. She was deep in conversation with the farm women, but when I started to put my nickel on the counter, her palm was outstretched to take it. Above on the wall was a framed portrait of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who had beaten out Hoover as President of the United States. Mrs. Cripe and the farm women were remarking on what a handsome man Franklin Delano Roosevelt was. Don't it beat all how a man that good looking would marry a wife that plain? said one of the farm women, who'd have known a thing or two about plainness. That Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt is plain as a mud fence. Maybe she's a good cook, the other farm women offered. Kissing don't last, good cooking does. Mrs. Cripe rang up two nickel sales on the register. Men don't have any idea about women, she said. This big statement quieted the farm women. Then Mrs. Cripe said, "These cousins, you know. Who is? The Roosevelts. He married his cousin. The toothpicks stopped dead in the farm women's mouths. You don't mean it. It was in the paper. Mrs. Cripe reached under her apron to adjust a strap. Was it legal? A farm woman whispered. I couldn't say, Mrs. Cripe replied. Them Roosevelts isn't Illinois people. What's that scene doing in there? It has nothing to do with the kids. They're not going to meet President Roosevelt or Mrs. Roosevelt. Well, it's in there to tell you the time, what people were talking about. It's election time, and suddenly everybody's looking at Washington. That happens every four years. And Illinois people think that the East Coast and people like the Roosevelts are living on another planet. I think maybe people still think that. <laughs> and so when you find uh, things that are going on in 1932 that are just like now, it's great fun to put them in, to let your readers know the history, that history isn't that far away. Well, Sarah Ann and Derek have both been impressed by Grandma Dowdle's sense of humor, her downright nosiness, and her commitment to the underdog. She's a one-of-a-kind person. Tell us a little bit about writing humorous books. I love writing humor. I love to laugh. I don't think young people laugh enough. And when they do laugh, they laugh at each other and not themselves. And that's not what real humor is. But if you're an American writer and you love humor, you have a role model ready-made. And his name is Mark Twain. I grew up not very far from where he grew up, and Mark Twain gave me permission to be a writer because he wasn't from England and he wasn't from New England. His characters spoke the way people spoke in my hometown, and though he had been dead several years before I was born, please believe me, he gave me permission to write American humor, and I keep The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn on my desk. And on days when it's hard to write, I put my hand on it to feel his heart beating. Because everybody needs a role model. And be sure your role model is never anybody near your age. Why do you say that? Because Mark Twain had lived long enough to achieve what I wanted. Okay. How do you, how do you think Grandma Daddle would have been different if she hadn't been kicked out of the eighth grade? Yeah, that's fun. You remember, she got kicked out of eighth grade because she took off her underdrawers and stuffed the stove with them and smoked out the school. Uh, I mean, when, when she wants out of school, she wants out of school. I think if she hadn't been thrown out, she'd have thrown herself out. First of all, she was born in 18, 1869. 
and very few country people in America would have gone past eighth grade. So that she'd be typical of her time. But also, I think, she's not the kind of person who would want to be in a room any longer where she was not the authority figure. So I think two reasons why she gets kicked out in eighth grade. However, if you want to know what grandma would have been like if she had gone to high school, you can read my brand new book called The Teacher's Funeral. And in it, there is a great big high school girl who's still in school, but she's not the student. She's the teacher. Because when the teacher dies, they hire a high school girl cheap, and we learn how she becomes a teacher. So that's really Grandma Dowdle. What if? Grandma Dowdle turns a bad deed into something positive, almost like a Robin Hood character. She broke the law when she was trap fishing, but then gave the fish she caught to the homeless in a long way from Chicago. In a year down yonder, Grandma found a way to get more pecans to fill the ground, to fall on the ground to make pies for the school party. Yes. Would you share that part of the story? Sure. Um, Grandma never plays by other people's rules. And maybe like your grandmother, she hates to spend money. She wants it free. Um, and she is a Robin Hood character, and I was thinking of Robin Hood because uh, after she's stolen fish, she'll feed the homeless. Now she wants to go to a Halloween party for the community, so she needs to make some pies, pecan pies. Does she have pecan trees? No, why not? Because I say so, and I wrote the book. <laughs> but there is a big pecan tree nearby in, on somebody else's territory, so she waits until nightfall, of course. Grandma's very busy at night. <laughs> yeah, I got that from Dracula. Uh, <laughs> There's a pecan tree, Grandma said. Them's pecans. She pointed to the ground, but I couldn't see very many. But then moonlight doesn't show everything. Old man Nyquist, who owns that tree, said I could have any that had fallen. And he knew there wasn't enough to make a six-inch pie. I had an idea he was pulling my leg, the old... But she was drawing out two gunny sacks and, and an old one of Grandpa Dowdle's. Well, let's get what we can, she said. We bent double and worked the yard. Be careful what you pick up, Grandma warned. Not everything in a yard's a pecan. He owns a dog. It was dim, hard work. It took me forever to find a handful of pecans. Grandma was doing no better. Her gaze fell on old man D Nyquist's barn. A tractor stood just inside the open door. She handed her gunny sack to me. Between us, we didn't have enough pecans for a tart. If trouble breaks out, she muttered, cut and run. I stood rooted to the spot while Grandma drifted toward the barn, keeping the house in her sights. The barn stood in its own shadow. Oil drums and chicken crates and bald tires leaned against it. Grandma stood in the moonlight. She rolled an old tractor tire off the heap. Hitching it under her arm, she advanced on the barn door. The nose of the old Massey Ferguson tractor stuck out. She hung the tire from its radiator cap. Now she was half swallowed by the darkness of the barn, then swallowed. An ear-splitting explosion rocked in the night. The tractor roared to life, coughing and gunning. Old man Nyquist's dog shot out from under the porch, yelping, and chased himself all over the yard. The tractor lurched forward, gathering speed. As it crossed the moonlit yard, there was Grandma up in the tractor seat, white-headed and high. She could start that tractor, but could she stop it? The pecan tree stopped it. Grandma, who didn't know how to drive an automobile, aimed at the tree and hit it dead on, ramming it with the tire over the radiator. The tree reeled in shock, and pecans rained. It was a good thing I wasn't standing under it. A ton of pecans fell altogether like a hailstorm. When the tree hit bark, it bounced, bounced back and the engine died. Grandma's head snapped back, but she was still riding it. Now she was climbing down. She loomed up at me and reached for a gunny sack. Grandma! Did old man Nyquist sleep through all that? Who knows, she said. Work fast. <laughs> now, is that stealing, Mary Alice wonders later? 
And then she thinks, no, in grandma's mind, it is not stealing because she's going to feed other people with the pies. Mm -hmm. Actually, grandma's kind of like a teenager. She believes the rules are for other people. <laughs> um, where does humor come from and how do you know what is funny? I don't know what's funny until I try it out, of course, because adults laugh at different things than young people do. Uh, but I, I try them, things out and I read other people's books, my friends who write in this field. But humor is difficult, that's why we have so many sad books and so few happy books, because it's easier to make people cry than to make them laugh. Well, I'm curious as to, to what Sarah Ann and Derek find humorous. Hmm, wouldn't we like to know? <laughs> Um, humorous to me is falling down and embarrassing yourself or something. Or knocking the set over. <laughs> yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. And what would be more fun than knocking the set over? If a teacher did it instead of a student. <laughs> yeah. I, think, I feel a novel coming on. Right? <laughs> sure. Uh, yes. American humor is what you say. It's falling around. It's falling. It's physical. British humor is words. Well, I'm an American who went to college in England, so I want everything. But I have a lot of hitting the tree. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the word is Pratt Falls, when a character keeps falling down. Uh, silent movies are great for that. They give you a lot of ideas because they don't use any words, and you can add the words. Mm -hmm. But yes, we like physical humor, we Americans. And I like to put that in. And it's harder to do in a book than it is on film, isn't it? And that's another challenge. I love it. A Year Down Yonder <clears throat> is told from Mary Alice's point of view. How is it different for you, the writer, to come from a girl's point of view? How is it different to write from a point of view of a girl than a boy? Well, you have to give yourself permission to do it because you don't want just half the population reading your book. You want everybody. Besides, I had let Joey grow up in this book. He's in World War II. He's gone to flight school. He's too old to tell the sequel. I didn't know I was going to have to write a sequel. Why did I have to write a sequel? Because he got a Newbery. Because it got a Newbery silver medal, and the, li and the editor said, You should write another one. And it should be a sequel, and we will need it by... Thursday. Thursday, right. <laughs> 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 uh, so, I didn't... All I had left was Mary Alice. So I asked her to come and see me. You can do that if you've created characters. And she said, what do you want? And I said, I have to do a sequel and you're all I've got left. Do you want to be in it? She said, maybe I do, maybe I don't. But I'm sick to death of being a kid. Make me 15. Well, that made it 1937. So all I knew was Mary Alice had to tell it because she was the only grandchild left and it was going to be 30, 1937 because she didn't want to be this little Shirley Temple clone anymore. And it won the Newbery Gold. So I'm glad that I can give myself permission to write in the viewpoint of a girl and the reason I can is I once taught in a girl's school. And though that was a scarring experience, <laughs> It gave me permission to write in the voice of a girl because I read their papers. So I hear the rhythm of their voices still. Besides, I want to write from boys' viewpoint and girls' viewpoint because we all live in the same world. Well, you say that openings are very important, that a story has to capture a reader from the start. I can still quote from the opening of your new novel, The Teacher's Funeral, It Struck Me So Hard. Would you mind sharing that with us now? Yes, I'm, my whole career is the search for a perfect opening line. Because if readers don't like not line number one, they'll never see line number two. So sometimes I write the opening line 26, 28, 30 times. But I found the perfect opening line. It took me 33 books, but I found it. And it's in this book. And here is the opening line. If your teacher has to die, August isn't a bad time of year for it. 
the perfect opening line. Shall we read on? Yes. Yes. It's the point of an opening line. You know, August. The corn's earing, the tomatoes are ripening on the vine, the clover's in full bloom, there's a little less evening now, and that's a warning. You want to live every day twice over because you'll be back in the jailhouse of school before the end of the month. Then our teacher, Miss Mert Arbuckle, hauled off and died. It was like a miracle. <laughs> Though she must have been 40. You should have seen my kid brother's face. It looked like Lloyd was hearing the music of the spheres. Being 10 that summer, he was even more willing to believe in miracles than I was. You couldn't deny Miss Mert Arbuckle was past her prime. She was hard of hearing in one ear, no doubt deafened by her own screaming. And she couldn't whoop us like she wanted to. She was a southpaw for whooping, and she had arthritis in that elbow. So while she could still whoop, it didn't make much of an impression. So when you get right down to it, if you can't hear and you can't whoop, you're better off dead than teaching. At least that's how I saw it. Um, uh, Lloyd thinks that since it's a one-room schoolhouse, a one-teacher schoolhouse, and the teacher died, they ought to just close the school down, throw the key down the well, and free us all from education. Shall I let him let that happen? I don't think so. I'm going to give him another teacher, and he will be her, she will be his worst nightmare. Oh, it's a comedy, of course. I didn't want to call it a comedy. It's called the teacher's funeral, but the president of the company called me up last J January and he said, you cannot call a book the teacher's funeral without letting them know it's a comedy. So he said, you'll have to put in a subtitle, extra words. I said, okay. And I thought of three. Always give them three, then they choose one, then they think they thought of it. <laughs> so it was the teacher's funeral, a comedy in three parts or The Teacher's Funeral, a comedy of 1904, or my personal favorite, The Teacher's Funeral, a comedy with snakes. Uh, the uh, head of the company chose the dullest title, <laughs> subtitle, <laughs> so it's a comedy in three parts. But he wanted to make sure that everybody knew this was a comedy. I said, if you put the right cover on the book, they'll know it's a comedy. They didn't. <laughs> This book is set in the Midwest in the early 1900s. In it, Russell, the narrator, dreams of leaving his town to go to work on the steam threshers like the Minnesota Little Giant and the Pitts Challenger. Why did you write a story about a boy who didn't achieve that dream? This is the first time I've ever written a story about somebody who didn't get his dream. And there's a reason for that. Because my father had the same dream that Lloyd does. He wanted to quit school in seventh grade and go up to the Dakotas and work on a threshing machine team. And he went, my dad did. He left seventh grade to go up there and work and he never came back to school. And that was 97 years ago from right now. So I've written a book in which my dad doesn't go. There's somebody in his life who makes him stay and get an education. Because a book isn't what it is. A book is what if. Well, the relationships uh, are humorous, and, and the, particularly the relationship between Russell and his sister Tansy and his younger brother Lloyd. Can you talk about those relationships and, and how they affected Russell? Yes. A story is always about a family or a search for a family. And I don't like stories that are hallmark cards with mommy and daddy and the kiddies. You will notice in 1904, in this story, the mother is not there. She has died. So there's a great aunt, uh, there's an aunt. And then in all of my novels, there is an old person. And I'm like grandma, because you like old people better than parents, right? Yes. So, uh, and in this one, I've done so many grandmas that I don't use a grandma. There's an old lady in the, t in the district named Aunt Fanny Hamline. And is she mean? Yes. Is she meaner than grandma? Yes. And rich. And she thinks all the kids are stealing from her and trespassing on her property. Is she right? 
Yes. Uh, so I make a community that's very tight with all the generations because I'm afraid you may not know your grandparents. So I'm going to give you some. But in a lot of my novels, people don't have two parents because in a lot of my readers' lives, they don't. So I experiment with all different kinds of families. And this is a one-room schoolhouse. And so the kids in the school become a family because everybody's a different age. And so all of my stories are about creating a family, even if you don't have a perfect one. Are, any, uh, are all endings as important as openings? I mean, do all endings have to have a happy ending? All endings are important, but of course, they're not the first things you read unless you cheat and read the last first, as some of us do. But uh, do they all have to end happily ever after? No, I don't write TV. I don't write that stuff. My stories end at a new beginning. In the new story, R Russell, much against his will, has to stay in school. And so we see what his future will be. Is he happy about it? Of course he's not happy about it. He wants to be up in the Dakotas. But is he going to have a better life? Yes, he is. At the end of A Year Down Yonder, Mary Alice has had to go live with Grandma for a year. It wasn't what she wanted. But at the end of the year, she has found the woman she wants to be one day. She also has found out that Grandma is something more than a grandma. She's a human being with even a few flaws and weaknesses. But she's still the woman Mary Alice wants to be. She wants to be that independent and in the long run, that beautiful. Covers reach readers even before the openings do. Does the writer have any influence on what covers look like? Yes. Now, now that's a very important question because you work so hard on that opening line, but what gets to them first? The cover. And especially in the bookstore for people who are seeing it in paperback. And I'm never very happy with my covers, but I can't do them myself. I'm not an artist, but I can complain. I was, ex uh, I did for some reason get the cover I wanted on A Long Way From Chicago. I wanted the high moment in the story. And the high moment in the story is Joey getting to take the airplane ride at the county fair. And he says in 1933, if I don't get to go up in a plane to this summer, I'll never get to go up in a plane. Of course, I send him to flight school uh, because he, so he does get his dream. But I wanted that on the cover, and I got it for some reason. So when I had to do the sequel, they said, what do you want on the cover? And I said, I want the middle story again. It's Christmas. Grandma needs money for Christmas. It's something she can't steal. She wants money. So I went to my country cousins and said, how did people make money in the summer, in the winter, on the farm, in the Depression? And they said, they trapped furs fox, muskrat, mink, whatever they had, they skinned them and sold the furs to the furrier. That's how they made money in the winter. Perfect, I said. Gives grandma another chance to be armed. Uh, and so I wanted the midnight scene with grandma and Mary Alice going out, running their traps. Here's the cover. They showed it to the head of the company and he said, that's a very dark cover. Isn't this a comedy? They said, yes. I said, we don't do dark covers on comedies, throw it out. And they did this. Well, I don't like this because I think it's too much the same color as the first. I was terrified librarians would say, but I've already bought it. Uh, I hate these, these covers. It won the Newberry. <laughs> and then guess what happens? Other countries buy your books for translation. And then you begin to see what covers look like in foreign countries and what your book looks like to people in foreign countries. Here is my fun, wonderful, loving grandma in Chinese. Can this be a comedy? I don't know. I can't read Chinese, but it's scary. <laughs> and then the Italians bought her. 
and called her Il Fusili de Nona Dowdle, the shotgun of Granny Dowdle. And here she is. Suddenly she's turned soprano. You just never know. But it's very exciting to open a box and find books that you wrote but can't read. And they've given all kinds of covers. But you can't tell a book by its cover. Open it. Read it. You, you've made your living by words. Do you have any advice for others who may be considering the same oh, course? Yes. Because I wanted to be a writer when I was younger than anybody in this room or anybody watching. I wanted to be a writer when I was four. And so here's my advice. Learn five new words a day because you're going to need a bigger supply than you have. I need words from, uh, from the Civil War, so I have to know where to go get them. I need wor words from the 1930s, so I go to Time magazine. I need words that you say, so I hang out at shopping malls, walking behind teenagers, writing down words, not all of them. <laughs> and here are three words you'll never need again in your life. Like and you know. You know? Those are three words you'll never need. Um, and if you know a lot of people who say, you know, all the time, just turn to them and say, no, I don't know. And I'll never know from you because you're verbally anorexic. Uh, get out of my life. And by, and by the time you get rid of all those people, you'll have plenty of time to write. Words. It all begins with words. Lay in a supply. Well, you mentioned, um, you mentioned the Civil War, and The River Between Us is a very different novel. Yes. It's not a comedy. No. Now, when you're talking about the Civil War, you can't play it for laughs. There might be a light moment, there might be a light song that people sang to lift their spirits, but it's a tragedy because who pays for wars? Young people. And they pay sometimes with their lives, and they pay with their futures. It's a story about a boy who loses his arm in the Civil War. And that's a good day because it's a good wound. And he knows he can't fight anymore and he won't be killed. But he dreams of fighting for the Yankee side. The only problem is he has fallen in love with the most beautiful girl he's ever seen. And she's a Southern, Southerner. She's Confederate to her core, and she's from New Orleans, so she's French to a fault. So what will happen? This is called conflict. The whole Civil War is being fought between two people, a beautiful girl and a boy. What will happen to them? Well, she has fled the South with a very dark secret, a family secret. And so that's what this story is. All my novels are about families and family secrets. Write to me and tell me your family secrets. Well, it's now time to uh, turn to our viewing audience and get them involved. We'd like to invite you to call 1-800-672-0067 or email us at kcperfarts at aol.com if you have questions for Mr. Peck. Meantime, Sarah Ann, did you have another question for Mr. Peck? Will there be more stories about any of the characters that we've come to know in this novel? In uh, A Long Way from Chicago and, and yes. A Year Down Yonder. Well, Grandma Dowdle is popular and people write saying, can we have some more of her? I don't want to work her to death. She's been good to me. Uh, but uh, people say, but Joey would grow up and get married and have kids. Couldn't he send them back to her? Maybe he could because she's never going to die. Do you know why? Because I say so. <laughs> Maybe. Will Grandma, Grandma Daddle ever, ever return? Well, I, she might, but she might the next time be a great-grandma. She might be in her 80s instead of her 60s. That's interesting, because that gives, puts her at another time of life. We'll see. And Mary Alice could be a mom by then. She could. A younger Grandma Dowdle. Mm -hmm. Well, we have questions from our studio audience. Uh, who's our first questioner? Yes. 
why do you write to mainly younger people? Oh, that's a, a wonderful question. I could write to anybody I wanted to, but I choose you, teenagers, because I was once a teacher. You can tell I was a teacher by looking, can you? And uh, you were the people I liked the best and knew the best. And from our first mornings together in class, I knew things about you your parents dared never know. And since writing is all really about secrets, I choose you. Also, I want to get to you early in life while you're still making decisions. And I want to remind you that they better be your decisions and not somebody else's. When readers write to you, what do they talk about? When readers write to me, they talk about their lives. They tell me about their families. Uh, they don't ask me much about mine because I don't think they're, in, I think people are more interested in their own lives than any, anybody else's. They tell me often about the role they play in their family. They tell me about younger brothers and sisters who drive them crazy. crazy. And they tell me sometimes about having to be parents because they don't have parents. And they talk about school, and I love it because those may be the days when I don't hear any other voice. And so they become my friends. What was your big break when becoming a published writer? That's a good question. When was my big break? My big break, of course, was getting the first book published. That's a problem. But I lived in New York, and I'd been teaching. And I had been teaching in a middle school. How scary is that? Uh, and I couldn't find anything my students would read, so I decided I'd write a book that they would read. And then I took it to a publisher in New York and said, I wrote this for my students. And he published it. And that was uh, 33 years ago, and it's still in print. A book called Don't Look and It Won't Hurt. That was a big landmark. That was the day I knew that I was a writer because until you're published, you don't know that. And that was 33 years and 33 books ago. Do you, do you have a favorite author now and do you have time to read for pleasure? Ah, do I have time to read for pleasure? Yes, I make time to read for pleasure. But then even when I'm doing research for a book, that's a pleasure for me because it's easier to research than to write. Uh, Ma Mark Twain will always be my favorite because he gave me my start. But I like reading my contemporary uh, colleagues too. Will Hobbs is one of my favorite writers. He wrote about, about teenagers called, about being a teenager called Down River. I wish I'd written it. I read Chris Crutcher. He wrote a book called Running Loose. Oh, I wish I'd written that. Sarah Dessen wrote a book called Dreamland, which should be required reading in every school. I wish I'd written it. So business and pleasure mingle in my reading. And I have to know what my, my colleagues are doing, because I might get a wonderful idea they've already done. You're a reader and a writer. Do yes. readers have to be? Yes, nobody but a reader ever became a writer. You have to read a thousand books before you can write one. But then. If you want to be a writer, you want to read a thousand books. Words. Words. What's your favorite book you've written and why? The most famous? Your What's favorite. your favorite book oh. you've written and why? Oh, my favorite book. Aren't they all my babies? <laughs> should, should I play favorites? Of course I play favorites. Some because they didn't do as well as I thought they should. They're my little misunderstood child. And some because they did really well, like Grandma Dowdle books. I'll tell you what my favorite one is. It's always the next one. And I'll tell you what I'm working on now. I wouldn't tell just anybody, but I'll tell you. This book is called The Teacher's Funeral. So I'm writing a book now called Here Lies the Librarian. Gee, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, you can't please everybody. And it's based on a tombstone. Would you like to hear what's written on the librarian's tombstone? Yes. Okay. Shh. Oh. <laughs> Here lies the librarian. After years of service wise and true, heaven stamped her 
overdue. <laughs> and when they lose the librarian, they have to get another one. Another one. <laughs> it's one that doesn't go shh all the time, I'm sure. <laughs> Wait and see. And that's my favorite book because I don't know how it ends yet. Have you ever stopped writing a book because of frustration or, or any other reason? Have I ever stopped because of frustration, did you say? Yes. Oh, yes. Every day I stop. Yes. Uh, writer's block? You've heard of writer's block? Well, there's a government agency that will help you with it. It's called the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, you write for a living. You say, I don't feel like writing today? Tough. But yes, it's hard. I get into the middle of a book and I think, can I make this happen? But I think it all the time. And I just keep at it because I, want, I keep writing to see how it ends. It's frustrating to write. It's much more frustrating not to. We have an email from Washington, D.C. The uh, question is, do you travel around the country to talk about your books? Yes, I travel around many countries to talk about my books. Um, that's where I get my ideas. I find out what young people are reading, and I find out things from their librarians and their teachers that I need to know about their reading, about their lives, about what they're learning in school and what they're not learning in school. I wrote a book about the Civil War because I don't think my readers know enough about the Civil War, and I found a story nobody had ever told, and it's not in anybody's textbook. And I learned that by going among my readers. Besides, I'm getting older every minute, and they remain the same age. So I write with my feet. We have another email from Washington, D.C. Uh, the the uh, question is, what is the process, your process, for ri writing? And do you write every day? I don't write every day because I travel so much. I'm not writing today, as you see. So when I go home, I just hit it hard. But here's how I write. I write from beginning to end as if I'm reading the book, not writing it. I don't outline because I want my characters to come with, up with ideas that didn't occur to me. And when I get to a page and get frustrated and can't go on, I go back to an earlier page and retype it. And I find I want to make a lot of changes. Then when I get a page exactly the way I want it, I go back and take out 20 words because you've got to say it in the fewest words you can, and they've got to be just the right ones. Yeah, no. <laughs> uh, she doesn't do that. Um, I back and forth, back and forth. And a, a year later, I've come to the end. And when I come to the end and see how it, how it ends, I take the first chapter and the first line and without rereading it, I throw it away. Then I write the first chapter that really goes with the book, now that I know how it ends. Because the first chapter is the last chapter in disguise. And all of the clues have to be in the first scene. You learn that by reading the works of a lady named Dame Agatha Christie. She, write, she wrote mysteries. I don't write mysteries every time, but every book has to be shaped and the clues have to be there. So that's how I do it, times 33. We have another email question, and that is, do you, do you ever write about contemporary times? Yes, I started out writing contemporary stories because when I began, a young adult novel was always about a problem or an issue happening now. My first novel, for example, written long before my present readers were born, is a story about a girl who chooses to go to a home for unwed mothers. But it's turned out not to be her story. It turned out to be her younger sister's story, a younger sister who has to hold the family together. A girl, a younger sister who isn't in the kind of trouble adults can no longer overlook and wonders what's in life for her. And all these years later, it's still being read, I'm happy to say, called Don't Look and It Won't Hurt. That was a contemporary novel. But now, after 2001 and September 11th, I will devote the rest of my career to writing historic novels. Now that we see that history does repeat, 
but my readers haven't lived long enough to see it repeating in their own lives. I've seen it in mine. There was a Pearl Harbor at either end of my life. And so I'm going to tell as much history as I can through the medium of fiction for as long as I can. Let's go to our studio audience. What is the best part of being an author and what is the worst part? The best part of being an author and the worst part. <coughs> the worst part is starting and the best part is finishing. When I start, I'm depressed. I'm worn out if I read, write one paragraph a day. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know why I'm doing this. I don't know who these characters are. I'm upset. But a year later, when I'm putting the final touches on it, I am feeling good. I can feel the whole shape of it. I know how it ended. I can go back and make changes and improvements. I do my own editing. I don't want my editor to do anything. And I am feeling so good. I can't wait to show it to the editor, too, because she would be the first reader. So the first, I have trouble getting started, but then I don't have so much trouble later on. Other writers start easily, and then they run out of steam. You just find out how you work, but that's it. The other part I like is the travel, the meeting readers, the going everywhere and seeing what people are doing, because writing's very lonely work. So you want to be out with the people. And to be invited to places is great, especially places you would never have gone. And there's a story to be written. An email from Woodridge, Virginia, uh, wants to know, where do you get your material? Uh, in the library, in school visits, in the memories of people who were old when I was young. Those are my sources. I never use myself as a source because I don't think I know me well enough. I know some of my ancestors better than I know me because I have given them traits I want them to have. Uh, so I always write about other people. We write from research, not experience. We write from observation, not experience. We write about other people for other people. So I go anywhere for my source material. But the library is where I begin. Do we have another question from our studio audience? Um, we want to thank you for visiting Hilton by giving you a gift to Do remember us by. Being here is a gift, but I'd be glad to have a bear. It's a bulldog. A bulldog, of yes. course. And it's spelled D-A- B-U-L-L-D-A-W-G-S. That's a misspelling, <laughs> but I like it. <laughs> Go Bulldogs. <laughs> do we Thank have, you. Do we have time for one more email question? Uh, this one is from Washington, D.C. And I think you've touched on this, but they, they would like to know who your favorite author is. Yes, I have touched on it, and, I ha and also my favorite authors change when a new one comes along. I like a, an English writer in my field named Louise Renison because she writes funny, and I always need another laugh from another source. And then back I go to Mark Twain because I never get tired of him, and he never, ever grows stale. Well... I think we're just about out of time, and, uh, but I have one more question uh, f for you. you. You frequently use historical settings. How do you think historical settings are, uh, uh, are meaningful to contemporary readers? What can contemporary readers learn from history? I think the number one thing they can learn is you're not so different from your parents and your grandparents. You are part of a tradition. And that is great because you will be a parent and a grandparent one day. Do you think contemporary students have a, 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 as much of a sense of history as perhaps you did when you were growing up? I don't, and that's why I write. This. I, wrote, I, I grew up in a place surrounded by old people who told stories about the old days and how they were better. 
And now I'm afraid that my readers don't have those old people, so I'm going to give them in books. We want in books what we cannot find anywhere else. Not in a video game, not in a TV show, not at the mall. Because a book isn't what is, it's what if. I have one last question. I think it'll be my last question. Where do you get your names? I mean, the names of your characters. I get the names of my characters, again, at the library. If I'm writing a book about 1904, I find a lot of books and magazines from 1904 and take the names out. And so uh, a book I'm writing now is set back then, so the girls are, in the story are named Irene and Grace and Geraldine and Lodelia. I got those books from, uh, those from then. If I, am, if I want foreign names, and we often do, I use the Brooklyn phone book. Interesting. Well, we're just about out of time now. Uh, it's, it's been a pleasure to be with you today, Mr. Peck. Thank you. thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. I'd also like to thank the young readers in the studio from Hilton High School for being with us and to the viewing audience from across the country for tuning into the program. Special thanks to teachers Lori Stern and Megan Hostetler, and also to Sarah Ann LaProd and Derek Braxton, who co-hosted today's program with me. If you didn't get a chance to ask a question today, you can contact us using the email address on the screen. We'd love to hear from you before, during, and after the shows, and answer your questions. We'd also like to invite you to visit the Kennedy Center website at the addresses on the screen there, you'll find additional information about this program, the link to the web streaming, and to the Kennedy Center's upcoming programs, as well as other resources on integrating the arts into the curriculum. Our next program on December 9th will feature Tony Award-winning songwriters Janine Tesori and Dick Scanlon. They will discuss their careers in musical theater and thoroughly modern Millie. Thank you for being with us. Before we go, I'd like to ask Mr. Peck if he would read his dedication about reading in Anonymously Yours, written from the viewpoint of a young reader. Mr. Peck? Yes. I read because one life isn't enough, and in the pages of a book I can be anybody. I read because the words that build the story become mine to build my life. I read not for happy endings, but for new beginnings. I'm just beginning myself, and I wouldn't mind a map. I read because I have friends who don't, and young though they are, they're beginning to run out of material. I read because every journey begins at the library and it's time for me to start packing. I read because one of these days I'm going to get out of this town and I'm going to go everywhere and meet everybody. And I want to be ready. Heads. What if? What if you had continued teaching? What if you hadn't, you know, written for your students? And over and over. What if I were young today? Yeah, that's a good what if. Mm -hmm. But you can be young in 1904. You can be a young person in 1860. What? What year is that? 69, right? 64.